Good morning. <clears throat> it was a wonderful life. I loved and I was loved. I sang, I heard music, I saw flowers, I witnessed sunrises and sunsets. I took long walks. Even in places when I was alone, you and my heart helped me turn loneliness into precious solitude. What a wonderful privilege it's been. I still have some concerns for my family, for the world, for the planet, but I put them in your blessed hands. I trust that whatever in the web of life that needed me to be there is now completed. I thank you for taking the burden from me. I thank you for keeping me in the light as I let go and let go and let go. And it was a wonderful, wonderful life. And you were all privileged to be a part of Marion's story. 92 years she graced our world. And I especially love and appreciated how at peace she was with her mortality. When you live a good life, death isn't to be feared, but welcomed. And so this morning we gather to do a few things, certainly to give voice to our sorrow, to acknowledge our loss. But more than sadness and sorrow, it is gratitude that beckons us here today. For all of us are thankful for the wonderful gift of Marion's life. Her friendship, her love has blessed each of us. And for that, we are forever grateful. Please join me in a word of prayer. We pause just to think, to consider life. This is a sacred moment for us because life is sacred. Life has given to each of us a place to belong. And Marian has belonged in the lives and affections not only of ourselves, but of many others through the years, and we are thankful for this. We are thankful how day after day she gave of herself. Thankful for how she allowed us the blessing of her friendship. Thankful for her big heart, her huge spirit, her gentle, quiet way, her caring. We are thankful for the ways in which she inspired us and how she could challenge us. Thankful for every good thing we saw in Marion and for the friendship and anchoring we drew from being a part of her world. Her life has now run its course. We still have opportunity to finish ours. May we learn from Marion as we let her go, thankful to have been a part of her life, and as we determine to hold her memory dear now that light has lifted from her pathway, so also we look for your light to continue to be upon ours. Comfort us in our sorrow and our loss, this we pray. Amen. Marion completely scripted this morning's service, which is a real gift to a family. She picked the hymns, the scripture readings, the solo that Cindy would sing, and all of it. And uh, what, a, what a wonderful woman. And so we're going to start the service by singing, Just As I Am. Why don't we do verses 1, one 3, and 4. 1, 3, and 4.
And then the scripture readings first from the book of Ruth, from the Hebrew Bible, chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. But Ruth said to her mother-in-law, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more, also if anything but death parts me from you. And then that great chapter from John, John 14, verses 1 through 6. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may also be. And you know the way to where I'm going. But Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then from the book of Revelations, chapter 21, verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. In that day, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more. For indeed, the former things have passed away. Here ends our scripture reading. The Next Place by Warren Hansen. The next place that I go will be as peaceful and familiar as a sleepy summer Sunday and a sweet, untroubled mind. And yet, it won't be anything like any place I've ever been or seen or dreamed of in the place I leave behind. I won't know where I'm going and I won't know where I've been as I tumble through the always and look back toward the when. I'll glide beyond the rainbows. I'll drift above the sky. I'll fly into the wonder without ever wondering why. I won't remember getting there. Somehow, I'll just arrive. But I'll know that I belong there and will feel much more alive than I have ever felt before. I will be absolutely free of the things that I held on to, that were holding on to me. The next place that I go will be so quiet and so still that the whispered song of sweet belonging will rise up to fill the listening sky with joyful silence and with unheard harmonies, like a hush of music made by no one playing, like a hush there will be no room for darkness in that place of living light where an ever-dawning morning pushes back the dying night. The very air will fill with brilliance as the brightly shining sun and moon and half a million stars are married into one. The next place that I go won't really be a place at all. There won't be any seasons, winter, summer, spring, or fall, nor a Monday, nor Friday, nor December, nor July, and the seconds will be standing still while the hours hurry by. I will not be a boy, or a girl, or a woman, or a man. I'll simply be just, simply me, no worse or better than. My skin will not be dark or light. I won't be fat or tall. The body I once lived in won't be part of me. I will finally be perfect. I will be without a flaw. I will never make one more mistake or break the smallest law. And the me that was impatient or was angry or unkind will simply be a memory, the me I left behind. I will travel empty-handed. There is not one single thing I have collected in my life 
that I would ever want to bring, except the love of those who loved me and the warmth of those who cared, the happiness and memories and magic that we share. Though I will know the joy of solitude, I'll never be alone. I'll be embraced by all the family and friends I've ever known. Although I might not see their faces, all our hearts will beat as one, and the circle of our spirits will shine brighter than the sun. To Those I Love by Isla Pascal Richardson. If I should ever leave you whom I love to go along the silent way, grieve not, nor speak of me with tears, but laugh and talk of me as if I were beside you there. I'd come, I'd come, could I but find a way, but would not tears and grief be barriers? And when you hear a song or see a bird I loved, Please do not let the thought of me be sad, for I am loving you just as I always have. You were so good to me. There are so many things I wanted still to do, so many things to say to you. Remember that I did not fear. It was just leaving you that was so hard to face. We cannot see beyond, but this I know. I loved you so. Twas heaven here with you. So Marion was my choir seatmate for many years when we first came here. Always smiling, twinkle in her eye, and so sad when she wasn't able to be in choir anymore. But she would sit right out there and smile up at us when we sang and always encouraged me. And I'm so grateful that I got to have her in my life for whatever time we had. It was lovely. And I just share my grief with you. Okay. <laughs> no, I'll try to sing. <laughs>
Thank you all very much for coming. It's so nice to see faces in person. Even if it's plexiglass between us, it's better than a screen and a computer. I know Marion was thinking about this day and she wanted it to go just as it's going, so I'm thankful for that as well. <clears throat> when, um, when she passed, I asked some people, you know, what were some words that came to your mind and remembrance of Marion Butt Gardner. And I heard things like oh, determined and feisty, <laughs> brave. Um, she was able to deal with change very well. And, and like Reverend Graham mentioned, um, these were true right up to the, to the end. Um, we were blessed that we had some time to spend with Marion uh, after she had heart, had her heart attack. And she was calm and feisty, but in a good way. Um, she was calm. And it made me think that, you know, another good word for Marion was, was resolute. And she resolved to do things, and she, she did them. So while we had some time together to remember and, and think, uh, I asked her, you know, what were some of the best times that you remember in your life. And without hesitation, she said, my wedding day. <clears throat> and it's fitting because when you got to know Marion and understand her story, um, her life changed dramatically at that point in her life. Maybe not her wedding day precisely, but she had had a very different life before her wedding day than she had after her wedding day. And of course, in order to understand a person, you have to understand the whole story. You know, she was the youngest of, of nine um, at a time when big families were more common, but still nine's a pretty big family. And, um, you know, her mother had basically been pregnant or nursing or changing diapers for most of the previous 20 years when Marion came along. And she came along in a pretty good time, November of 1928, but it didn't last because in less than a year, the whole world had changed. It had been a crash and Depression. <clears throat> she also was born into a uh, pretty, pretty tough area. Uh, my mother wasn't born near Kendall Square, Cambridge. She was born in Kendall Square, Cambridge, back when it wasn't just an appendage of MIT and a, a hot spot for startups and, and wealth creation. Uh, at that time, it was gritty and industrial and loud and noisy and dirty. And there were street cars and there were horse-drawn carts. And she was in a small house. Uh, in, a, in a big place and a mere 10 minute walk across the Longfellow Bridge from Boston and another five minute walk to Beacon Hill, but she was a world away. She was born, born to <clears throat> uh, my grandparents, both of who, whom were immigrants and came to this country when they were young people. <clears throat> and they were Victorians. They were born when Victoria was Queen of England and they were subjects of hers in Scotland and in Canada. But they, they left, even at the height of the British Empire. Uh, so I'm not sure how high that empire was, if, if you were ready, willing, and able to leave it. But they came to America, and they did better. But it was tough going. My grandfather uh, was a Victorian, but his upbringing was practically Dickensian. He um, didn't walk till he was five or six years old. He had severe rickets. Um, his father died when he was in grade school. He never got out of grade school in terms of his education. And so when Marion came into the world, her father worked at the Ford factory in Somerville. They don't call it Assembly Square for nothing. And he had a decent job, but not enough to own a car. I don't know where Henry, Henry Ford's theory came from, but he never owned a car in his life. He never owned a house in his life. But he had come a long way from his childhood, and Marion came even further from hers. So she was born at a tough time. Both a depression and then a world war followed. And um, she had a difficult personal experience when she was a very young child as well. I'll just give you the headlines. Diphtheria, third degree burns over 20% of her body, and a skull fracture, and that was all before the age of four. She spent, she told me, months in the hospital, isolated as a three-year-old from her mother and from her family. <clears throat> because of the fear of infection, when you had severe burns, they just which in isolation. 
Despite that, she remembered her childhood when I spoke to her most glowingly through her recollection of the Agassiz School. When the Agassiz School had its 100th anniversary, she was part of it. She took part in that, in that process. And she loved learning. I think when she got out of her house and got into a school environment, she saw a much different world. She was always a reader. She was always a learner. When I was a kid, she always had a book within, within arm's reach. She was always reading. And she also was privileged to be in a city that was vibrant and interesting. There's no better place to grow up in Cambridge me. And she um, also uh, remembered that even though she was born when Calvin Coolidge was president, um, the only president she remembered was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He was a president for her entire childhood, from when she could remember until he died when she was 17. She only knew the New Deal. It was no old deal. It was just the deal for her. And her politics reflected that her whole life. But at the end of the World War, like with the United States and much of Western Europe, things got better. And while growing up poor and having a, some personal hardships was difficult for her, there were people during her adolescence who had it much, much harder. There were hundreds of millions of people in Europe and in Asia that had an even tougher time. <clears throat> so when she uh, faced post-World War America. She had left her house when she was 17. She never graduated from high school, despite her love of education. She found herself working in Cambridge, and she met my father. They met through the First Baptist Church of Cambridge, which was a pillar for her. And I think her faith throughout her life reflected the experience she had as a young person with that church. It was a big part of her life in a very positive way. <clears throat> Same with my father. They met at the church. And within a couple of years, they got married. And for Marion, things really turned around. And she was resolute about that. She was very determined to have her life reflect her will rather than her past. And to me, that's a huge lesson. So they got married and in 1949. And where did they honeymoon? Meredith, New Hampshire. <laughs> They've been coming to the Lakes region in one form or another since 1949. They loved it up here. My father called it God's country. I don't know whether that's a reflection on the First Baptist Church of Cambridge or not, but he loved it up here. And they started with their home in Waltham, Massachusetts. And within a couple of years of getting married, a couple of years of my father returning from the war, also without a high school education, they had a house and a child. And then a couple of years later, they had a better house back in Cambridge. Two family, a stone's throw from Harvard Square, and a car. And then they bought some property in New Hampshire because they loved it so much. These were people without high school education with a factory job. My father was a factory laborer. <clears throat> in East Cambridge, a couple of blocks from where my mother was born. And they toughed it out. They rode the American dream. My mother may have had some, some turbulence in her early life, but she got some wind in her sails after 1949. And throughout the 50s, they just kept trucking away and had more kids. And before you know it, Harvard University came knocking on the door and said, we'll give you a few bucks for that house you got there. And they said, OK, and moved to Belmont, the next town over. Ooh. Suddenly, their kids were going to some pretty nice schools, too. So like the American dream, Marion's dream was to do better and grow and realize much greater things than you had known or that your parents had known. It was all about mobility and growing. And at 92, you can see the amount of history she also saw. It wasn't just social mobility. She's just entered the world when radio was coming online. She saw the golden age of radio. She saw the entire age of television. She saw Cambridge go from horse-drawn carts and streetcars on Hampshire Street and Broadway to what it is today, where I don't think any of us can afford to live there. And she saw the city of Boston change dramatically as well. She saw civil rights movements. She saw the generation gap, the women's movement, the New Deal, and the new society and the great society. That's an awful lot. She lived through a very interesting time. 
And because she was so interested in learning, because she was so adamant about knowing what was going on, she was a ferocious you know, consumer of news. She had the radio on every morning, WBZ, to hear the news. So a few more years later, after telling us kids, you can and you will, and being resolute in her ideas about making your own way in the world and not looking at the past, but always focusing on the future. She had that house in Belmont, and they had a house on a lake in New Hampshire, and they had two cars, and they had some kids on the way to college. It really was the American dream. It's pretty astonishing. We didn't think it was special. We just thought this was the way it always was for everybody. Now, 50, 60 years later, it may have been a very special time. You know, um, Marion also thought of herself as a feminist, and I wouldn't argue the point with her. <clears throat> she saw a family of nine, and as the youngest, saw both the good and the bad of that. She was very much about family planning. It's not a coincidence that her three kids came five years apart. She was also very adamant about women working. She had her driver's license in 1955, when, believe it or not, not that many women drove. She had a full-time career job, not just a factory job, but a career job, before Mary Tyler Moore had her job. <laughs> and she thought of herself as uh, pretty darn accomplished. She was a dental assistant. She thought it was a great way to go. You know, both my parents made the money that they did make, honestly, through hard work. My father worked for a company that made caskets. It's a necessary thing in life. My mom helped people get their teeth fixed. Honest work, hard work, you know, they didn't make money by hyper-capitalism or winner-takes-all economics. You, you, you pay as you go and you get paid as, as you work. So that whole feminism thing <clears throat> really worked for my mother. She was a full-time mom and a full-time worker when I was eight or nine, ten years old. I was one of the original latchkey kids. I don't think it did me any harm. She was about making, you know, the idea of growth w w was important, but she didn't conflate self-worth and net worth. She didn't think of herself as better because she had money. She thought of herself better because she got better. And she, re re she liked the idea that you weren't a product of how much money you had, you were a product of what you did. And she was a little bit ahead of her time on that, and maybe some people have lost track of those sorts of priorities. So she, le she lived the American dream during the time when the United States was in its American century. Her, her parents left the British Empire at its height, but she saw and lived through the height, perhaps, of the, of the American dream. And you know, she loved to travel. She was always open to new experiences. She had been to oh, Bermuda. She had been to Canada. She had been to Mexico. She saw California. She loved to travel. She always wanted to go to Greece. She never made it to the Greek islands. Maybe she learned about them at the Agassiz School. I don't know. She was also very crafty. Not crafty like a Molotov. Crafty like a Martha Stewart. <laughs> she had sewing going or knitting going or needlepoint or was building doll houses or helping my father in his wood shop with, with wood projects all the time. Reading she, you know, my mother was never idle. You didn't see her sing around. She was always busy, a beehive of activity. And that was also right up until very recently. She also had a great laugh. You know, you could hear that laugh quite a distance, um, probably across Braves Field in Boston. And there's an interesting story that she liked to tell. She was at the very first night baseball game in the history of all baseball. It was a lighted stadium at Braves Field, now part of Boston University. And she was there that night when they lit it up. It was a big deal. And you probably heard her laughing all across that field. She was also very adamant about making sure that her kids felt loved. And, and we did. She didn't always have the best vocabulary for, for expressing it. But she was adamant about that idea of being felt wanted. I think she saw a contrast to where she came from. So she was brave right to the end. She was feisty. She was someone that you'd, you know, encounter and, and, and remember. 
One of the things I guess you could say about my mom is she was a tough Boston gal. And she had that in common with some of her sisters. You think of Adeline, you think of Jean, you think of Gladys and Mary. These were tough Boston gals. You know, if it was fight or flight, it was more likely to be a fight. <clears throat> and their chief weapon was their mouth. <laughs> you did not want to get in an argument with one of these gals. Be careful. So she had sort of two sides. It was interesting. Uh, she had some, in some ways, crushing insecurity, and, and she struggled with self-worth, but she also had towering determination and a resolute perseverance. And you never knew which one was necessarily going to come out, but in the end, it was always the latter that won. It was always the perseverance and the determination that won out, not the feeling of inferiority that would happen from time to time. You know, another few things about Marion is um, she loved to eat. She was, uh, had an amazing appetite <laughs> right up until the end. Uh, one of the things we did recently is we took a drive around the lake, as we often did, and, um, you know, we got fish and chips, one of her favorite dishes. And man, she chowed that whole thing down. <laughs> 92 years old. <clears throat> Didn't seem to do her any harm. She loved music and singing, as Cindy pointed out. Um, you could hear her voice. I could always hear my mother's voice across the church. Um, and along with that laugh. She, um, she loved Sawyer Lake and our camp. She spent a lot of time up there and enjoyed the outdoors and the fresh air. She would always remark on it. She always said the food tastes better up here. She didn't know why. I don't either. And um, we had 20 years together uh, watching the Patriots. We saw just about every Patriots game in the last 20 years, which was a lot of winning. Um, my mother loved the Patriots, and we had so much fun. And I'm so thankful that it was watching a lot of wins and not losses over that time. Um, I mentioned her travel. So, you know, Marion rode the American dream, and it was her personal dream as well. They aligned. Um, she wasn't captive to her injuries or weaknesses. I can and I will, she would say so many times. We heard that so often when we were kids. You know, sometimes uh, her will to do better may have gone a little overboard. She could put some pressure on people. Those who have received a nanogram would be familiar with that. But I think she meant well. I think she meant well, even though she pushed pretty hard sometimes. So she's left us with quite a legacy. There's grandchildren, children, great-grandchildren. Uh, we're all a lot better off than we would have been two generations ago, and that hasn't happened that often. Uh, we, we grew up during an unprecedented period of mobility, and she didn't hesitate to take advantage of that. Um, and this idea of willing yourself into change is, is hard. It's also perplexing. You know, I think science ponders whether there can be free will, and religion wonders if it's all God's will. Um, I believe in the free will of individuals, and I know that because my mother taught me. And, 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 you know, what do we learn from humanity more than we learn from our mother? That's what mother's kind of about. So thanks, Mom. Thanks, Marion. Um, please, if any of you all would like to uh, offer some words or remembrances, um, we'd love to hear them. Thank you. <clears throat> Marion's daughter Taryn couldn't be here her husband's undergoing chemo um, treatment so I have some thoughts from Taryn my mother Marion Gardner experienced an amazing myriad of things in her 92 years she was born the youngest of nine and grew up in the depression of the late of the 1930s her childhood was tough in her adolescence she was forced to quit high school at 16 after her junior year and worked full-time to contribute to her room and board. She worked hard her entire life to improve her life and the lives of her children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. My mom was an inspiration to the women in her life, friends, family, and even strangers. Because she was a strong gardener woman, not only did I become a strong woman, but also my two daughters and two granddaughters. On the day mom passed, my granddaughter, mom, mom's great-granddaughter, Caitlin, 
wrote the following about her. My beautiful great Grammy Gardener, where do I even begin? You have taught me things I will carry on for the rest of my life. You have taught me things that I will carry on for the rest of my life. I'm so grateful I got the time I did with you. I will continue being the strong gardener woman you taught and fought for us to all be. I love you endlessly. We will miss you, Mom, but know you are still an influence on every day of our lives. I said goodbye, held her hand, and now I have a lifetime of her in my heart. Is there anyone else who would care to share a thought? You want to come up? Most of you know me by Gigi. Um, my, my mother was a good friend of Marion and a sister-in-law. I lived in New Hampshire. We were the family that moved from Massachusetts to New Hampshire. And um, Dana and Aunt Marion and Uncle Carl would come and visit us at Bull Lake. And we would go canoeing and we would have a blast. Um, Marion and Uncle Carl moved up here um, when I was, I believe, pregnant in 1986, um, and to have my family close by, other than my brothers and sisters, uh, my brothers, my I lived right next door to my husband's family, so I have family that's close by, and that was very, very comforting to me. And to my mom died when I was um, 13, and. Um, that was a hard time, and family, Gardner family, held us up, uh, the kids, and to be able to talk to Aunt Marion and know what my mom was like before my parents, before I was born, um, was very, very comforting. And the story was when my dad and my mom were dating, Uncle Carl and Aunt Marion were dating, because um, Uncle Carl was going and uh, my mom was going, they came to New Hampshire on a vacation and rented a cottage and there was a divider between the two bedrooms and the girls slept on one side and the boys slept on the other. But for them to get up here, my dad had to fix a car. He was welding in Massachusetts somewhere and he was, um, he had to hook the car up on a, a crane and weld the radiator so it would stop leaking and weld the bottom of the car, but he didn't do it so well because you didn't have to have an inspection. Um, Marion said that she could see the, the road going down the, uh, while they drove to New Hampshire <laughs> for vacation um, and a trip away. What treasure that was for me. To know that my uh, to hear about my mom before I was born, and to have know that they had so much fun together, and your mom will be missed, and I'm sorry, and I'll be praying for you. Anyone else? <clears throat> Yes. I'll just say from here that you clearly uh Marianne's niece uh, from Massachusetts. And I just want to say that I carry with me uh, all the love uh, of her uh, family from Massachusetts. The Cleary clan sends their love, and especially from my mother, who was the sister in law, Ellie Cleary. 
Thank you so much. Sandy. <clears throat> Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. so much. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh, we'll close the service singing one of Marion's favorite songs, Here I Am, Lord. We'll do verses one and three. One and three.
On behalf of Marion's family, I thank you not only for your loving presence here this morning, but for all the love, encouragement, and care you shared, their, the show, the, shared with the family. Everyone is invited down to our fellowship hall to continue sharing stories and enjoying some good food. And may we go forth knowing this, that a life well lived doesn't end any more than music ends. It echoes through time with whispers of beauty and grace. If we listen, we can hear the encore with our hearts, for the song plays on as surely as Marilyn's love lives on. Amen. Oh, oh, I see. Hey, it's happy new baby. <laughs> 